pleasure to be here. Can everyone hear me okay? Great. Um, how many of you have had a family member uh, affected by cancer? Raise your hand. Okay. Me too. How many of you have been very frustrated by our medical system and how it handles that family member with cancer? Well, not bad. Well, I am. I'm frustrated. And this particular picture of a gentleman who is with his wife and is asking why was this cancer not caught earlier is something that I've focused my life on for about 30 years now, since the age of 20. And if everything goes well, I'll focus on it for another 50 or so years to solve it. I often explain to uh, my graduate students and postdoctoral fellows that we're in the field of research, not search. There's a good reason the word re is in there. You have to keep searching over and over and over for solutions. And things in our field take decades and decades to bring to fruition. So we stay patient while we fight for what are hopefully improved lives for your children and their children's children. I'm very frustrated because we have not done a good enough job in really changing medicine to be able to diagnose diseases such as cancer earlier. We can do much, much better if we all put our minds to it. As patients and as future patients, we can also do a phenomenal job if we take better care of our bodies and also screen ourselves for disease. But we as patients often fail to do that as well. So it's going to take both doctors and patients working together to do this. Let me tell you why in the case of cancer, I think this is a solvable problem. If we plot on a graph the stage of the cancer, with stage one, two, three, four signifying more and more cancer cells leaving the site at which they originated and spreading throughout your body as a function of survival out at 10 years, you'll see that when we can catch the cancer very early for almost all cancer types, your chance of survival is very high, 95% plus. But when you catch the cancer later, which is, of course, the most often point in time in which we currently catch it, the chance of survival plummets. And this is illustrated by two images here of two different patients. The patient on your bottom left has breast cancer. Can you all see the focus in her right breast? Looks to, it's to your left, but it's her right. Can you see that black dot? Those are molecular spies that we've put into her body that have wandered through her bloodstream and have gone in and homed in on cells that are cancer cells and are now sending us signals that there are cancer cells hidden in that part of her body, in this case, her right breast. You'll also see signals coming from her brain, but those are different signals not related to cancer. That's someone caught relatively early, and I'll come back to her throughout this talk, so remember her. But look at the other person, a different person, on the top right. Look at all the areas where our molecular spies are sending us signals saying the cancer is spread throughout this person's body. The person actually feels normal. That person does not know, even with that extent of disease, that they actually have cancer in this case. So what's the problem? We spend a hundred times more as a society, as a world, on treating things very late in the game, cancer included. Research dollars, pharmaceutical companies, even philanthropy, because it's much easier to think about a problem after you have it, as opposed to before you get the problem. It's very hard to motivate you to take better care of your body and to screen yourself on a monthly or yearly basis till you have the disease. And we've lacked technologies that can reach into your body at that fine a level. But that's starting to change. If we look at breast cancer, when a woman feels or a man feels a lump in their breast, men get breast cancer also, when they feel a lump in their breast, let's say about half an inch or so on each side, that's already about three billion cells. And you can bet many of those have left the site 
spread through lymph nodes and gone to other parts of the body. We need to push down so that when there's just a few thousand cells that are starting to have problems or dividing uncontrollably, that we can detect those cells. How do we catch, though, just a few thousand rogue cells very, very early? Many of you in this room have cancer now. We won't know it for at least a decade because we don't have the tools to be able to see just a few thousand rogue cells in your body. So we've been thinking about this problem very hard for about 30 years now. And to take you through that journey, let me have you pretend that we're all part of a different alien race and that we've been given the task of studying the planet Earth, studying it for all its complexities, its continents, its rivers, its oceans, its cities, the details of its cities. And that's much like trying to understand what's going on deep within the human body. In fact, it may even be more complex than the planet at Earth analogy. So let's say we're this alien race. What might we do? We might first send a satellite from our planet to Earth, like shown here, and start to take photographs. You could take all the photographs you want from a certain distance, and that might be kind of like an x-ray, where you start to see the silhouette of the heart, the black lungs where there's air, the bones which are white. But it really doesn't tell you what's going on in the cells inside your body. It's a very crude look, just like aliens looking at the planet with a satellite getting a crude look at how the Earth functions and how people on Earth function. But you may say, well, we do way better than that. I've seen all these fancy CAT scanners, CT scanners that can take beautiful images, show you in detail what's going on with your organs, the blood vessels, but even that doesn't let us see disease very early because the disease has to grow to enough cells to perturb the anatomy. We want to go to a much earlier point in time. How do we do that? Well, even if we start to image things, like in this case the heart beating in real time and look at what is called physiology, it still really doesn't answer this question of how do you do a real detailed search of what's going on inside the body. So what do you think is the answer? Well, we're this alien race. Eventually, what would you do? You would beam someone down onto the planet and have them observe things and report back to the mothership. Now, I want you to take a real close look at the person sitting to your right. Okay, take a real good look at them. You may think they're human, and if they're your spouse, if they're your spouse, you're, you already know they're not human, okay? But you would eventually conclude the same thing we concluded, that we have to be able to send little spies into your body. And our dream is that these spies live with you, they're in harmony with you, but are communicating back signals signals of problems going on inside your body. This is an example of a part of your body, let's say a city, that we've really zoomed in on. And again, we need to do a house-to-house -house search. These spies need to blend in so that the rest of the molecules in your body don't know they're there. They need to be able to watch what's going on with all your cells, your molecules, and then they need to have a walkie-talkie that sends signals back to us. We build these spies. We have spies that do different things. Some spies that measure one kind of disease, some spies that measure another kind of disease. We don't have yet a generic spy that can tell us anything that's wrong in your body. We often test these spies in small animals to make sure they're safe, to make sure they're not perturbing your body. Right now, many of the spies are peed out. Other spies live with you for a while and then leave you. But after we're sure they're working, then we move them to humans. And we're getting faster and faster at doing this. When I started 30 years ago, this cycle took us about nine years to get to humans. Now we do it in about two years, meaning a new spy all the way from concept to first proof of principle. Here's our patient again on the bottom left with breast cancer and a spy that's gone and again looked at and detected that breast cancer. On the middle bottom panel are spies that are looking at early Alzheimer's disease. 
although not a focus of today's talk, spies that can detect all kinds of problems, not just cancer, are something you should keep in mind. So what do we see as the future? We see that you will have diseases identified very early through blood tests, urine tests, other things that I'll share with you in a minute. That will lead to very precise imaging, imaging that will include things like these molecular spies, and that will lead to very early intervention. Intervention where we can hit your body very early and destroy those few rogue cells long before they go on to create a problem for you and long before you would have known anything's wrong with your body. How do we do the first part? Well, the cancer cells, as they grow in your body, actually shed things into the blood. As the cancer cells grow, they actually die as well. They release their contents, and there are some specific things being made by them that are not usually made by normal cells or are made in less amounts by normal cells. Because your body is trillions of cells, finding what these cancer cells are releasing is no easy task. But several things, proteins, DNA, RNA, microRNA, many things start to be released from cancer cells very early. So how we detect these very low levels of blood products from cancer cells in the future? Well, the beauty of Stanford University is that we have the best minds in engineering, medicine, business, humanities and sciences, you name it, all working together. This is an example of a next generation technology known as the magneto nanosensor. This is a postage size, postage stamp size chip that has its roots in hard disk drive design, magnetic technologies, but with a drop of blood, we can actually search for telltale signs of cancer in your blood that no other technology would have been able to detect. How does it work? The yellow slab that you see there is called the GMR, the giant magnetoresistor. Attached to it are molecules that we put on the surface that are designed to lock on to anything present in your blood. Now we drop your blood, and if there is a cancer protein circulating in your blood, it binds to this antibody molecule shown in blue. And then the sensor still doesn't know anything's happened because the sensor only senses changes in magnetic fields. But if a new molecule with a tiny little magnetic nanoparticle is added, and it also binds to this protein that might be present in your blood, then we get a change in magnetic field. A magnetic field change that's only possible if there's this tiny, tiny amount of protein in your blood being shed from just a few cancer cells hidden somewhere in your body. This is read by a simple reader, and that reader then in five minutes lets us know across a series of proteins that you may be harboring the early signs of cancer. That then lets us proceed to imaging, imaging that can help us identify if in fact you do have the cancer. In 20 years or so, we hope to have a whole body solution to this, where your entire body can be scanned, looking for the minutest cells, molecular spies sending signals about those cells going awry, giving us anatomical information, molecular information, very high spatial resolution, so that we don't have to catch the disease late. We don't yet have a whole body solution, but we are starting to get good with regional solutions. This is a spy that is used right now. If you walked into the hospital today, this would be used to help find cancer. And this particular spy has a walkie-talkie on it that sends out a signal that we can detect, the orange box. Right now, we don't communicate with the molecules. They only send signals to us. But we're building the next generation of molecules or spies where we will also communicate with them, letting them live inside you for longer periods of time, sending us signals back. Here's an example of a new spy that we're going to be testing in humans soon. It's called a micro bubble. It's a gas filled bubble that will oscillate. If you yell at it, it yells back. So what we do is we build these spies to home in on abnormal blood vessels that cancer cells need. We inject these spies, as shown here, right into the bloodstream. And you can see them floating around with red blood cells but eventually they go and find targets, molecular targets, found only on abnormal blood vessels that cancer cells need to feed. 
And that then lets us detect early hidden cancer inside you in certain regions of your body. We also have a lot of scopes being built to do this that will go into your body and many other regional techniques that are evolving to be able to detect very early on either in high risk patients or eventually patients that are everyone that are at low risk for the presence of disease. So to end in this last 30 seconds, once this happens and once this vision comes true, all the drugs we use today, many new interventions are possible because it's not that the treatments are that bad, it's that they're applied too late. And it also opens up treatments where we don't have to use drugs and can treat you regionally, for example, with sound as in this case. Now the image I showed you was no ordinary image to me. That's an image of my wife. That's her molecular image 12 years ago when she was discovered to have breast cancer. And the picture on the right is her now. And we are thankful every day that she is alive, that her cancer was caught early. And she's the reason I'm up here today making all this work possible. Thank you so much. Thank you.